Hello, and welcome for the third session of OP244. If you have just joined our uh, class for the first time, make sure you type on your browser OOP244 GitHub. Then find out the notes for section NAA and ZAA. That's where your home is. So what you, what you do, you go to that website and you read and read. Ladies and gentlemen, for heaven's sake, read the instructions. Okay, so that's our problem as a student. We want things to be done quickly. Because of that, we don't read. We do it, then we hit the wall, then we read. First, read the instructions. Are we all good about that? And read the instructions, you will see. You're going to fail the test because you didn't read the instructions. Because when it comes to the test, I'm going to tell you, write, for example, the prototype of the functions that do does this and that. And then you write the entire function. But I only wanted the prototype. One line. And you write 50 lines. So you have to read the instructions properly. When in doubt, you ask the client. Who's the client? I am the client. You're the programmer, you're programming for a client. I represent your client, okay? So any doubt in anything you ask me, hey, part that, what am I supposed to do here, okay? Number two, that was number one, by the way, okay? So next thing, uh, this lab is all lecture because your lab number one is all IPC 144. I don't need to do any lab for you. I'm just going to explain to you how the things are, and you'll see. We're going to talk. I'm going to talk about modules. I'm going to talk about namespaces that many of you actually finished everything but don't know how to create a namespace. We're going to go through all those things. But today and the next day, it's going to be all lecture. So today, we're going to cover everything you need to know for your workshop one and more. OK? Um, So not to waste any time, we're not going to have any quiz this, this lab. Next lab, you have a quiz. Next, either the day you are coming here, I'm going to do it on paper. Yuck, I don't like it. Or we're going to do it in lab. And it's synchronous, so you all sit at the computer. You do it as if you are doing it in, on a paper, but you are doing it on a computer. OK? It's like 10 minutes with 10 questions. One minute each, you go through it quickly. So. Uh, the questions that I give you in test is all either multiple choice, like four different things, or I give you fill in the blanks, where I give you a walkthrough that generates only two letters on a specific concept. And you just write those two letters, something like that. So it's, that's why you have 30 seconds for a walkthrough, because it's an obvious thing. If you know what the concept is, you know what the output is. It's very simple. Okay? The tough stuff and tricky stuff, they come in workshop. Um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it or not. I'm very easy going when it comes to tests, OK? I, I'm, I'm very generous in marking, and I do not believe that any programmer can do, perform the way they really do in an hour and a half. It's like you're asking an artist to paint a painting in an hour and a half. They can't. They need three weeks to do that. That's why you do your projects, OK? But careful again. Remember about citing. Citing is extremely important. If you borrow someone's code, you cite. Otherwise, you get zero, and it immediately gets filed. I'm not going to just talk to you, say, hey, I gave you a zero. That's not the case. I actually report it, which means if you do it for the second time, you're out. OK, careful. All right? Hello. Sorry to making all these threats. I hate to fail someone with an average of B plus because somebody copied from them. Not even because they copied. Somebody copied from them. OK? I had to do for two people last semester, and I hate it. OK? Please. Cite it, and if you are giving your code to someone, make sure you write in your left reflection that, I don't know, Jack, Jill, whoever, ask for help, and I gave that person this piece of my code. So when the thing comes up and you are fit, facing plagiarism, you say, I already cited it. It's in my reflection. I go with it, you're in a clear. Nothing's wrong. OK? Remember that. OK, 
Are we good? Shall we begin? Forget about all these shebang and start actually doing some uh, C++ thinking. All right, so um, object orientation, we talked about it. We said object orientation is a, uh, we, write, we do programming in object orientation to simulate the real world. And to simul simulate the real world, we need three things to do in our program. Number one, what do we do? Encapsulation. Number two, what do we do? 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 Inheritance, number three, what do we do? They're the same. So that's encapsulation. So encapsulation is pushing the data and behavior together. Uh, uh, what do you say? Inheritance. Inheritance was reusing our oh, polymorphism. Thank you. So you were saying that? What Fox is? Oh, so I didn't. I didn't understand. So he was. Say, see, he was right actually. So so polymorphism was to um, create specific type of actions that happen in different ways, doing the same thing in different ways. Those three things, putting it together, creates an object-oriented. Following those guidelines, creates an object-oriented language. We can even write object-oriented language, object-oriented, we can do object-oriented programming in C. Very difficult thing to do, but it's possible. It doesn't have the tools. You have to jump through hoops and do crazy stuff to be able to do it. That's why they added one feature to C language. They called it C++. What is the feature? Object orientation capability to implement those three features into your language. Are we done with OB? Okay. I just give you a little schmiggly dinghy of what it is. You are responsible to read the whole OP thingy. You fill in the blanks. It's college. I'm not going to go through everything. I'll give you the concepts you need to be able to program. You go over there. You read. The next day, you come to me, say, I read that. You didn't mention that. What does it mean? Got it? Are we OK with this? Are we OK with this? Yes. <laughs> OK. We are OK with this. OK? So remember that. OK? Next thing. <clears throat> what the devil is object terminology? Let me take a look. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, abstraction. Abstraction, we said abstraction has nothing to do with object orientation. It's something that you need to do to be a programmer. Did I talk about it? Abstraction? I didn't talk about abstraction? Abstraction? Who knows what is abstract? Like when you're going to an to a art gallery, they say, this is an abstract art. What does that mean? A little too rich for my blood. Anybody simpler? What is, abs what is an abstract art in like a, if you want to explain to your seven-year-old? Based on? When you go to a museum, you look at a painting, you say business logic. No, no. <laughs> No business, business logic. I'm talking about abstract. We want to understand what is, what does abstract mean when you see an abstract art? Oh, bah, bah, bah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, some people interpret it that way, but that's not the case. Yes, why? Isn't that any type of painting? Okay. That's all type of painting. But you're right. I know what you want to go, but you have to be able to be able to express yourself. OK, let me just put everybody out of their misery. OK? So what happens is that an abstract art is the artist's point of view of how that thing is supposed to look like. So you see a triangle with two dots. And they say, this is a lady with a nightgown. And say, what? You yes, say, that's, when I look at a lady, I see a triangle with two dots. That's abstract. An abstract art is an art, which means the artist, how it sees something, it, Picasso, have you seen Picasso's work, right? It's like when you look at it, you say, what is that? It's a ship? No, it's, well, well pomegranate? I don't know. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy things, right? So that's what abstraction is. It means to take what you want, and set the rest of the stuff away and don't 
Look at it. I teach C++. Do you care that I'm bald? No. You need to know if I can teach or not. Do you know if I can salsa? Why do you care if I can dance? I need to teach you C++. So a good prof is a person who teaches you C++ and you don't care about anything else. You are doing abstraction every single moment of your life to be able to live. Otherwise, you go crazy. All people who have OCD are people that they get hooked on unimportant stuff. Like, it has to be like this. That has to be like that. Otherwise, I cannot work. Have you seen those people? Yeah. OK? So it is like that. I was like that for a long time. OK? But what I'm saying is that if you cannot look at, talk to the client, business logic. Somebody said business. You said business. If you cannot talk to the client and get what the client wants from whatever it wants to do, and throw away everything else, you can never implement the work because it becomes so huge. When you are implementing something, like it's addition, like things that you don't need, you have to set aside and only implement parts that are needed. Although in real life, that thing has 5,000 more features that you do not care. That's abstraction. If you cannot master how to abstract you how to get an abstract view of the problem you can never program and that's how, that's that's why you practice that's why you pra and with practice you get better and better and better it's kind of like a uh, like a curve so you become better and better and better and as you become very good in programming you become worse and worse because then your brain kind of switches back and forth. You want to do something, then you're in fight with yourself. Or maybe that's only me. Like, <laughs> you want to implement something. If should, do, should I do it? Should I not do it? It would be very nice. And you know what I mean? So remember, abstraction, what you want, to focus on what you want, and ignore the rest, OK? It's going to be in a quiz, by the way. Polymorphism, doing the same thing in different ways. Example of polymorphism? Monkey walks, human being walks, bird flies, robot walks, airplane, wa air airplane walks, airplane flies. So airplane and pigeon, they both fly in different ways. So that's a polymorphic thing. A robot walks and I walk. We do the same thing, not at the same thing. Uh, not, we, we, uh, not in the same way, so therefore that walking is polymorphic. OK, anyways. So a walking object, let's call it, or it's, um, ah, anyways. Or it's, and, and you can always do polymorphic stuff by classifying things. So um, you don't mind me to touch this stuff over here. You're OK? OK. So how can I put these two things in the same class? A cell phone and my water bottle. That was actually very smart, one of those smart beep type of answers that you do, right? But, yeah, <laughs> but, but no, it's like seriously, <laughs> think about, of course, they're both objects and they're both in your hands. <laughs> things that Farnad is holding in his hands. Yeah, so now, but how do we classify these two things? Uh, but that's why I was good. The second one that I said was good too. It's metal. They are both containers. It contains water. This contains data. Right? And the way they contain is a polymorphic thing. The containment of this one is pouring water in it. This one, you have to download data into it. You follow what I'm saying? So everything depends on your business logic can be classified into the same thing. All right, that's classification. That's what we are learning. The essence of an object, we call it a class. A class is how a thing needs to be. And then you can create many objects out of that class 
that they all act the same because they are of, the, of that type. We are all human beings, hopefully. No vampires here? They're all good. Okay. We are all human beings over here, right? We are all instances of human beings, different shapes and types. But as soon as you say human being, everybody can picture what we are talking about, right? You know exactly what a human being is. Good. That's what I wanted to see. So, so, and then if I go a little further than that, I can do classification in some other way. We have lots of students, and I have an employee, right? Lots of students and employee. Any of you work in Seneca? Like, I don't know, working in a lab or cafeteria or something, no? If one of you did, then in that manner, you and I would have been in the same category of employees. We are both Seneca employees. So you follow what I'm saying. So that's how everything works. This is classification. So the class cannot exist. The class is the idea. It's like I'm saying human, then I'm saying Fardak. Narrow, OK. <laughs> narrow? Narrow. Narrow. OK, so. so I have human being, I have Fardat, I have narrow. Human being is an object, is a class. We are objects of that type. Are we OK? We're good with that? So in C language, you call the classes types. You said integer, i, and j. Integer was the type, i and j was the variable, right? In C++, integer is the object. Uh, is the class, i and j are objects of type integer. Are we good? That integer is a class, remember that, okay? So this is what we are going through. Now we have simple classes that you cannot break it down. Those are primitive class classes in C language, C, C++. Whenever I see, say C, I mean C++. C, C++, potatoes, potatoes. One is subset of the other one. When I'm teaching C++, all C stuff working over there too. But it's just, it's kind of dif different in uh, uh, methodology and, uh, and design. So simple, cl simple classes, simple, simple types, they cannot be broken into pieces. If you have an integer, you have an integer, done. You cannot break it apart. Other otherwise, uh, uh, unless you want to hack it and see an integer is four bytes, no, no, not like that. What I mean is that as an entity, an integer, you cannot break it down. But if I create a class called coordinates, which shows what is the x and y of a dot on a, play, uh, on a paper, for example, or on a map, then it has two integers, correct? Coordinate itself is a type two, but we call those types compound types, a type that is built up of other types. You create a structure, you call it coordinates. We're going to do that now. OK? And you say x and y. Or you say, uh, try to come up with some, OK, I'm going to go through it and start coding, and you'll see exactly what I'm going to talk about. So these are the things. We talked about encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, and all those good stuff, so we know exactly what they are. So we actually covered some. I thought we didn't talk, talk about any of these. Modular programming is, uh, is what I did not talk about. Okay, now modular programming, uh, you have done it in C, right? In C you had a program and you had a main in another. So you kind of did modular stuff, but you did not really do it uh, in depth. Okay, so with modular programming, you put everything that is related to each other into a module. Okay, so As I told you, for the first few times, I, will, I am going to create the Visual Studio uh, project so it gets recorded and you see and you remember how to do it. Xcode people, I'm sorry. Uh, Mac, Linux people, I don't know. Like, well, however you want to do Xcode, I don't, I don't know what is that. But, but uh, anyways, we're going to just go with Visual Studio. One day, if I have enough time, maybe I'm going to record a video on that with my Mac. My Mac is a paperweight at home. <laughs> Sorry, Apple is against my religion. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so, oh. I like to have backspace and delete at the same time. Okay, so uh, <laughs> only Mac people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm creating a new project. The project you are creating is of type empty project always. When you start from scratch, that's how it is. When you have a project to start with, there is a file, you just click on it and it opens it, okay? But when you are creating it, uh, it's like that. So it's empty project CC++, you create that one, you click on next. You select where you want to do. Where do you create your projects? In your repository. You live and breathe in your Workshop Zero repository. You live and breathe in your Workshop Zero repository, and you keep committing and pushing in a committing and pushing and committing and pushing. I haven't marked everyone, you know that, right? But I'm going to take a look um, at the, 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 the Collaboration request, and as I do that, then I'm going to add it, if I have your information, the way I ask, okay? Mm, so, we are section uh, ZAA, so I'm going to go to ZAA, and uh, it's number two, and it's January 16th, so that's how I name my projects. Your names could be Workshop 1, Milestone 2 things like that, okay? Or in your sandbox, you may create different type of projects just to test stuff, I don't know. But that's the project name. You have to always make sure that this is checked. Never leave it unchecked, I hate that. It creates, again, w this one is uh, creating several projects in a solution. Our level is one project in one solution, so we don't need to have a nested directory. One directory for everything is good. So always keep that one checked. Create, and three years later, it's going to create it. <clears throat> All right. And that's that. Types in C++ is almost like C. So, and I'm going to say add new item. The item as I'm adding is C++, I'm going to call it prg.cpp, and I'm going to keep changing it as I go through, okay? So <clears throat> all the I.O. of C++ is happening in I.O. stream. We don't use CSTDIO. You are using CSTDIO probably in your workshop one because uh, um, you file or you want to do input and output, use printf. That is just, again, just for you to kind of uh, warm up on, on programming before we begin the semester. So you can use anything you want if you know. As long as it works, okay, I'm happy. So, so include IO stream, and I'm using namespace STD, which brings me to what the devil is a namespace, okay? You know what a structure is, right? You know what a structure is. Correct? I can have a structure called student. No, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to have a structure called teacher. Okay? Teacher structure can have what I'm calling. Please try to get the buzzwords that I'm using. Teacher structure can have an attribute called name. When I say attribute, what do I mean? Variable. Remember variable. When I say attribute, I mean a variable inside a structure. What is a structure from now on? We mentioned that last class. It's a class. So when I say structure, it is actually a class. It's not a structure. We don't have structures in C++. C++. Everything's a class. So if a teacher can have an attribute called name, correct? Correct? Then I can create another structure, another class for a dog. A dog can have a name too, with the exact same spelling, exact same type, case sensitive, both of them, N-A-M-E, both. Why? 
the compiler is not telling you, hey, you cannot have two variables with the same name. They are in different structures, correct? Okay. Now, when the programming becomes vast and the abstraction of the different groups of the same company on different scenarios collide, problem happens. Why? I want to have it. Let's say we are at Seneca College, okay? And this is the team that is working in education. And this is the team that is working in OSAP department. And this is the uh, group that is working in HR, okay? This section wants to create a class called student with all the information a student wants from the education's abstraction. Number of semesters, course passed, and all the good stuff that we have, right? This section that wants to deal with, with Ontario student program loan, whatever it is, only thinks about money and the depth and stuff of a student. So the student over here has some value that shows how much the student is in depth. This one doesn't care about that. HR over here is the department that hires a student as an employee. Nothing to do with OSA. Maybe they want to make sure that student is in a certain semester. Maybe they need some of the things. But the abstractions of these three groups about a student, they are all completely different. Do we agree with this? Are we OK with this? So how do, I, how do they create the class? What do they name it? They're a student. It's not something that I can change. The other one was a teacher and a dog, or they had nothing to do with each other. These are all students. How do they name it? If I tell them, OK, those people who are HR, name your students HR underline student, then it's not student anymore. It's HR student. Then polymorphism is out of the window. The whole idea about polymorphism is to have the same thing do. But anyways, so forget about that. Forget about what I said on polymorphism. We don't care about that. But the fact that you want to name the, and you are not even aware of each other. You are in different departments. You are not going to go talk to that person. Are you creating a structure, a class called student? You don't do that. You just name it student. How do we fix it? We're going to say, we're going to create spaces for you for names. What do we call those spaces for names? namespaces. And I'm going to say any code that this department is writing will be in the namespace edu for education. Any code you guys are writing will be in a namespace called OSAP, O-S-A-P. And this one, any code you are writing will be in the namespace called HR. Therefore, your student will be edu.student. Yours will be osap.student. Yours will be hr.student. These namespaces are not structures. They are not places to hold functions and do encapsulation and stuff. They are just, for, they are just spaces for names. So what is the difference between all laptops closed? OK. All right, now, what I was saying? Yeah, namespaces, see, this, this is what I hate, OK? I, I am deep in thoughts and trying to connect the dots, and suddenly I see two people are laughing. I hate that. Please don't do it, OK? So, what I was saying? Yeah, so you cannot have two structures with the same name. That collides, correct? I cannot have two students. But you can have two namespaces with the same name. You know what, the C, what C++ is going to do? It's like two bubbles that merge and make a bigger one. It just puts them together. So two namespaces together, they make a bigger namespace. They actually become a union together. But two uh, classes, they collide. They cannot exist. That's the difference between a namespace and uh, uh, um, a structure or a class, OK? So to you as a student of SDDS 
the part of Seneca, School of Data Science and yada, 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 you have to write all your code in OOP244 in SDDS namespace, which means anything you write, if we don't tell you, sometimes maybe we give you a workshop and we ask you to write it in a different namespace. But if we don't tell you, all your code should be surrounded in an SDDS namespace. How do we do that? You write namespace SDDS. And you write your code in here. Whatever you want. Your classes, your functions, your variables, anything that you write surrounds in here. Okay? So if I want to create a module, for example, to draw a bar, for example, okay? By standard, this is how you create it. So let's say, and by the way, this is uh, the main one. In main, you never create a namespace. In main, you always use a namespace. So the main module uses the namespace you develop in other modules, okay? So if I create, for example, in here, uh, I wanna create a module that draws a bar, okay? So what do I do? I'm gonna create uh, a header file. Header file. I'm going to call it bar. Notice that this is lowercase, not up, uppercase. I'll tell you why. Because this is C. I'm going to do this bar object, uh, not object oriented, in C, semi object oriented type of thing as the steps. So you're going to see that B becomes capitalized. Okay? When, when you are dealing with an entity, a class, they are all capitalized. When you're talking about functions, they are lowercase. Okay? So it's bar.h. I'm going to add that one. And I'm going to add a bar.cpp over here. What happened? Oh. Bar.cpp. OK. And this is how you do it. As soon as you create this, you have to do what I'm doing right now with your eyes closed, which means creation of a module is like this. First, that pragma wants thingy, you can completely get rid of it. OP345, we talk about it. We don't need it now. So you say, if not defined, and you write all capital, SDDS underline, what is the name of this header file? Bar. So you write over here, B-A-R underline H. Now, sometimes I put an underline after or not, doesn't matter, as long as they are exactly the same. To make sure that they are exactly the same, I don't retype it. And believe me, don't. Copy this, paste it, and change the second one to define. This, what we call it is compilation safeguard, which means this is not C or C++ language. It works in both languages, by the way, okay? But you are talking to the compiler not the C++ language. You are telling to the compiler how to compile your code. You are telling to the compiler if the statement SDDS underline bar underline H is not defined, define it. You are telling to the compiler, define it. And then you continue your codes. If by mistake you have this header file included twice, what's going to happen? The second time it wants to get compiled, it says, if not defined, but it's already defined. So the whole thing will completely be ignored by compiler. This is called compilation safeguards. Every single header file you include has this. And it guarantees, so you don't need to think about, am I, did I include it before or not? Okay. I just received actually a, a submission from somebody and they had some mistakes in there. So, uh, remember, you can have, I'm going to regret this, you can have as many submissions as you want, as long as, as long as you are correcting something that you have done before, okay, before the due date. So, so what happens? I just wrote something and Farda just taught something and I'm like, oops, I did that. I shouldn't have done that. I want to fix it. No problem. Fix it and submit again. I always pick the last one. Not only that, if you submit a working workshop before the due date and submit a correction after the due date, I don't consider it as late. 
because you already submitted something to me that works. Now you are correcting what you, so this is like all the things you do, every cell phone that you have gets updates every three seconds, right? It's the same thing, so I don't mind. If you give me a working thing beforehand, you're fine. If you don't, then you'll be fine. Then, then, then it's gonna, you're going to lose mark. Anyways, so that's what you do. That's number one. Numero uno. Okay? Number two, you write namespace. The f oh, what the devil is that? I have no idea. Namespace and the SDDS at the beginning is actually the namespace. So if I tell you this is name namespace ABC, then that's ABC underline bar. So in here you write SDDS, you open the curly bracket, and you close it, and this is an empty header file. A header file that has nothing in it, which means you write a header file, you should write this, you shouldn't even think. That's what you do right off the bat. Then, number two, you go to bar.cpp, you include its header file. You say include, oh, oh. if I can type it, bar.h, and write namespace sdds. Remember, two namespaces with the same name, they merge. No problem. And that's an empty source code for a module. Now I can think about how I'm supposed to write a bar. After, so this, no thought is put to it, through it. You do the same thing for every single code that you have written over there, right? So everything should be in a namespace SDDS and then. If you do not do this, then you cannot write it. So if I want to test my bar module in here, first, and another thing, always your custom header file should be included after the systems, not before. Another thing. So in here, I'm going to say include. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Include bar.h, okay, and using namespace std, and using namespace sdds, int main, return zero, and this, what I call, is a unit test for my bar module. Got it? Down to this point? So, and I'm going to write comments over here, so you have to follow these two, and in here I'm going to say, Custom, he custom headers come, come always after system. Okay? Keep that in mind. Number two. Number two. You never include a header file inside another header file unless you have to. So all those people who included the header files in their header files, you don't do that. Why? Because it's called hidden logic. What is a hidden logic? Hidden logic is that you do something and you don't know. By doing that, lots of stuff are being added and you don't know. If, for example, instead of including I.O. stream in here, I would say, oh, my bar is supposed to print something on a screen, right? So I'm just going to include the I.O. stream in here. Oh, by the way, includes don't go inside the, <laughs> inside the namespace too, okay? I'm going to say I'm just going to write it over here, and when I include that, I.O. stream is included too. No. The person who is including bar is expecting to include bar, not I.O. stream. Unless you have some definition inside bar.h that requires I.O. stream, then you do it. So remember, no, no header files included. So, and I'm going to comment this so we know. Do not include inside a header file, header file unless you have to. You will find out when. You will see it, okay? <clears throat> so this is not, so I'm going to do it that way. So that's, so these are the modules. What else do we do? So I'm going to put this thing back. And let's write the bar. So in here I'm going to write the bar. I'm going to say, what am I going to say? 
I'm going to say, uh, so let's create a bar. And uh, uh, my bar function doesn't return anything. And the bar function receives a character to draw a bar with. What it fills it with. And then we're going to have an integer length of the, of the bar. So that's my, what my bar will be. Okay. Then I'm going to go in my bar.cpp, and I'm going to implement that. So I'm going to say void bar. Uh, oh, uh, probably you in, in IPC you have seen people do this. And it says very OK. You do that, I resubmit your thing. You have to make sure, take the advantage of having your prototypes explain how your function works. I know this is not going to give you an error, but the poor person who's going to look at your code seven years from now had no idea what the heck is that. So in here, not only you say fill, you say characters to fill with. No problem. No shame in that. I know, in the function part, write small things so you can program quickly. That I understand. But in the prototype, let them see what you are doing, what you are passing in there. Okay, it's extremely important. So in here, I'm going to say bar length. Oh, actually, what kind of crime I just committed? Yes, one is camel kiss, the other one is bar. Always be consistent in your coding. Don't have two standards in one thing. If you are doing camel, stick with camel. Camel, by the way, is that. Camel is the one that you capitalize every new word, OK? And underline is underline, right? So, so I'm going to, and I, and I do both of them. Uh, you'll, you'll see that for, some, for only one thing, you're allowed to mix. I'll explain what it is. So, so that's that, and that's not length. Please correct my spelling. I suck at English language with spelling. Please, OK? Correct me. So that's that. Now I can come back over here and actually write uh, character fill and integer, um, integer length, right? So in here, I'm going to say, what do I do? Uh, for uh, fill greater than 0 and uh, len minus minus. And in here, I'm going to say, oh, we want to print something. See, here, I need to print something. I bring C, in, C out in. So in here, I'm going to say include IO stream. OK? Or I can even do this. And in here, I'm going to say C out uh, fill. And because I didn't use the namespace for the thing, I have to qualify my object. I have to say STD. So you can either qualify individual objects, or you can say using namespace STD and be done with it. All right? So that's it. So and we want to go to new line afterwards, so C out and L. And because I'm using two now, I'm going to say using namespace STD. OK? You can uh, open your notebooks if you want to. All right? So now in here, I'm going to say bar. Let me see if I, I try to write it in a tricky way, so probably it's not going to be right. So we'll see if it's OK or not. So oh, and I, uh, I said, and I put it completely uh, in, in reverse. So this is not fill. This is len. <laughs> OK, so that's better. Yeah, that's better. So now I'm going to say bar, let's say 10, uh, sorry, uh, with dash and length of 10. And then I'm going to have another bar with, say, plus length of 20. And control F5 executes and compiles and runs and everything. Boom. OK? Not for execute, sorry. OK. <laughs> OK, so it runs, and this is what we have. Are we good?
Is it 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yes, it's 10, so I'm good. Any question about the beautiful code I have written in here? Pardon me? Nobody told me to error check. Ah. Nobody told me to error check. If somebody put minus 1 over there, it's going to be an endless thing forever. But nobody told me. If they told me your bar should validate the arguments that are coming in, that wouldn't have been my code. But because nobody asked me, that is my code. How many people saw that type of for loop in IPC? No. OK, so, so <clears throat> ask questions. What the heck is that? So I can explain to you. OK? So <clears throat> first of all, for loop has three parts. So they told you what is the equivalent for, for a for loop when you are writing a while loop, correct? So if you are writing a while loop, this is, this is the equivalent. So if you are saying for A, B, C, and you write over here D, the while loop equivalent of this one will be while. Oh, it will be A while B. Then you do the D, and after D, you do C. <clears throat> are we OK with this, these two? Do we understand that these are the two equivalent things? They are identical things. They are good? Are we OK with this, everyone? OK, so. When you are writing a for loop, they just wanted to do be quick and don't write the thing. So they, it's like in here you're saying, <clears throat> I want a burger with flies and a drink. In here you're saying, I want combo number two. OK? They're the same. No difference. OK? All the loops can be written with, OK? So in here, what did I do? I didn't want any condition beforehand because whatever that is coming in is whatever it is, right? In here, I'm, gonna, I'm saying len. Now, I, I wanted to do this, but then th that would have been like crazy if I actually did this. I don't want to do that. We are, that's too rich for our blood at the moment. But yeah. So in here, I want to make sure that it keeps going down until it hits 0. We know in C language. What is false in C language? What is true in C language? OK, those people who said 1, you're mistaken. Non-zero. So 0 0.25, that's true. But the only thing that is false is 0. Are we good with this? That's why they said if it's negative, we are doomed. It's going to go forever, right? So, <clears throat> so then, and using this operator, comma, I can separate two statements in the same statement. So in here, I'm going to say, so I'm saying, do these two things at the end. So these two things happen at the end. OK? That's it. So now, I'm, and, and please, <coughs> please, unless you are working at Google, don't write stuff like this. OK? Because although it looks the way that, like, that you're kind of showing off, ooh, I know how for loop works, and what, you know what the condition is ah, in your face. No, you don't want to do that. You want a person who sees this to understand exactly what's going on. Yeah, if, we are, if, I'm, if I am programming this mouse that has 2K of RAM, 2K of memory, yeah, I'm going to do that because I don't want to have a counter. That counter uses four bytes, and the four bytes I want to actually keep uh, Keep it. I don't want to use, I want to use as less amount of memory that I want. But as what we are right now, we first write it like a human being, and then if we want to actually do something crazy, we do it. So this, with 25 years ago, I would have asked you to do that. Because 25 years ago, to be a programmer, they were, everybody were nerds. Like you were sitting in a classroom of nerds. That's what it was. Now, everybody wants to be a programmer, right? Therefore, at the time, believe me, it was fashionable to write a code that works and nobody knows how. 
Now you do that, they fire you in two seconds because the only thing that is important is for your code to be maintainable. A code that nobody understands how it works is worth nothing. It works only once. Good. Three years from now when I want to do an update, I have to throw it in garbage. Okay? So, so we don't do it like this. We're going to write it actually like human beings, which means integer counter or, or i, for example, for i set to zero, i less than len, and i plus plus. And in here, I'm going to write c out, fill, and go to new line. Now, everybody understand what the heck is going on. You follow me? Are we good? Just to have fun, I'm going to later on when we go a little bit uh, uh, forward in the thing, I'm going to give you like just brain teasers. I'm going to give you a function, like this must 15 lines. Then I'm going to say, write the exact same function only in one line. Just to, just to, why you go to gym and you bench press 250 pounds? Why? Because you, every day you are doing that? No. Because you want to challenge yourself so when the time comes, you can pick up 100 pounds without breaking your back. That's why you exercise, right? It's not like you, you have that type of a thing every day. So these type of brain teasers that I'm going to give you is to just, you know, keep you on your toes type of a thing. Class ends at 2.20, correct? All right. So now we have the bar. So now, if I run this, it works the exact same way, no difference. You see that you see exactly what I have, right? Well, what if I wanted to say, okay, if I want to, if I want to have, if I want to have a, a line, I just want to say bar. I don't want to say what is the length. I want to say bar and dash. And I want it to put 70 lines for me, a line, long line. So I, if I don't mention what the, size, what the size is, I want it to be 70. So how can I do that? In C language, that's impossible. But C++ is a polymorphic language, which means C++ doesn't only look at the name of the function. The name of the function for C++ is bar int int, bar car int. No. No. We can do it with something that you do for int of support. Uh, so, yeah. So, how do I do that? In C++, you can actually have another function, ladies and gentlemen, over here called bar, that has only characters to fill with with no length. Okay? Why? The first one is bar car int. The second one is bar car. So there are two different functions. They are doing the same thing in a different way. Right? So for the other one, <clears throat> what do I do? For the other one, I'm going to create void bar character fill, and in here I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write it again, I'm just going to say bar. That's a new version of bar. <laughs> okay, bar, so fill, and in here I'm going to put 70. There you go. So I'm actually calling the other one, I'm not going to rewrite the code again. <clears throat> Reuse your code. Always. Okay? It makes your code a bit slower. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. It all depends what you are programming. Now, we want to be able to write quick. That's what you do. You write an application, you quickly give it to the client, and everything works, right? And then six months later, you make the function calls efficient and everything, and you say, this is version 2.0. If you want to run it fast, if you want it to run faster, you got to give me, I don't know, $5,000, and I'll make it. So what I'm saying is that first, make it work, then sit back and look and see what you want. Always reuse your code, especially when you're in test and exam. If I ask you something like this, you just want to get over with it, right? Reuse your code. Always reuse your code, okay? 
So that's that. Now if I run the program and I have over here bar, say with a dot, it still works. And that's 70. We good? All right. So how does it work? That's called, that's called F10. Press the F10, and it runs it for you line by line. Okay? So F10 steps over. F11 steps into. If I am not interested to see, if I am not interested to see, I selected this one. If I am not interested to see what's happening inside bar, I can press F10, and pressing F10 will execute the whole function. It goes over it. But if I want to see what happens inside, I'm going to stop it, and again, this time I'm pressing F10, and when it comes to bar, I press F11. So it actually goes to the function. Now I can walk through the function and see how it works by pressing F10 over and over. Okay, so it actually walks through me and I can see exactly how everything works. Exact same thing in Xcode actually. You can have those things in there. I don't know which key is what, but you can do all these debuggings exactly how. So now, so these are how everything works and you can actually walk through it. And please don't ask me at, on Teams which key you kicked or, or you, you hit. Click on debug, it tells you step into F11, step over F10. Toggle point, what is, what is the, the toggle breakpoint? Uh, if, if you want to, if your program is 900 lines and you want to go on line 800, then walk through there because everything works perfect before that, you go bring the mouse right beside over here and ta, it put a stop sign over there. Now I press F5, not control F5. F5, it means run with debugging and it runs and stops right at that one, and I can continue now with F10 and 11 and go through it. Are we good with this? I want you to be honest. How many people knew this feature of Visual C? Thank you. So this is very important, especially when I write code for you and you want to see how it's running. And believe me, soon we're going to get to places that things happen behind the scene, and you need to understand it. You write one line of code, and that line, one line of code executes 50 things for it to happen. So you need this to see exactly how it happens. So remember, go play with it. And if you have an Xcode and you're an enthusiast, please record your thing, demonstrate it, give it to me, and I will add your video to the, to the page so people know how to work with the Xcode and do debugging and stuff. Please, have a really nice video, and, we'll, uh, and I'm going to post it, and it helps everyone. And I thank you. I may give you some bonus marks, too. Who knows? All right. OK, so that's that. So that's that. This, ladies and gentlemen, we call this one, and I want you to remember this thing. We call this one function overloading function overloading. If somebody asks you, what is an example for polymer polymorphism in C C++, immediately you say, function overloading is a good example. Ta-da. OK? Like, and, and, you can, and you can keep going. I can say, OK, what if I, if I only say bar by itself and nothing else? And by the way, we don't put void in empty thingies in C++. In C, you do. In C++, you just leave it empty. You don't put void inside. No void inside. OK? That means bar with nothing. OK? So now I can come over here, and I can actually create the other one. Now in here, I'm going to say void bar just by itself. And in here, I'm going to say it's a bar with, say, that one and 70 characters, something like that. And now I can actually call it like that, so I can call it like that, too. And now I have three different versions of bar running as you see now. Are we good with this? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? So, OK. Break, five minutes. 
Please remind me to unpause. OK, so the overloading that we have done is OK and it's perfectly good. But when you're overloading, you usually have the same logic. Like when you look at this bar thingy, I'm not doing anything different. They are all doing the exact. As a matter of fact, I'm calling the original bar, right? <clears throat> so overloading a function like this, we can do it ourselves, or we can ask C++ to do it for us. OK? <clears throat> How? So first, I'm going to set, uh, say, see, uh, this is how I do. So in here, it's going to be bar 1.cpp. I'm saving it as first one, but it's in reverse. So bar 1 is the old one. The one that doesn't have anything, it's just bar. That's the newest one. Remember that. It goes, by the ways, ah, I'm going to say over here, let's actually do something else. I'm going to do something else. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, let's uh, rename this. I'll rename it. I'm going to call that overloaded bar. So we know that's overloaded. And you have to fix the header file names and all this stuff, okay? So in here, I'm going to say again, so it's going to be A overloaded bar.h. And the other one, I'm going to change uh, change it to I'll do it later but <clears throat> instead of doing this what we could do was this take a look we could tell to the operating system uh, tell to uh, the we could tell to the we could tell to the compiler hey if the last argument was not provided put 70 instead if the first one is not provided, put the assignment thingy. Oh, what am I doing? Yeah. OK, it looks kind of awkward because it's assign, assign. But because when I was, I, I, I programmed it in a way that when I have, where's my bar.cpp? Oh, that's that. You? What happened? I know, but oh, this is prg.cp. My I see prg. My brain says bar. Can you believe it? <clears throat> okay, so now, so in here, as you see, when it's no argument, I'm saying it's assignment, right? So now I do not need to have these two anymore. Using the default argument values default argument values, I am telling to the compiler if they, did, they didn't provide this value past 70 instead. So this can be omitted. And then I said, even if this one is omitted, pass assignment character instead. So remember, but by, but, but, by what I did right now, my program works the exact same way with absolutely no problem. For those two that I actually provide values, for those two that I actually provide values, although the function is defaulted to be assignment and 70 over here, but because it has a value, it ignores the values that are assigned. And dash and 10 is passed. And for the other one, by the way, shift F11 executes the whole thing and comes out. So if you are in a function, you already are done with it, and you want to just quickly execute and come back and get out, shift F11 does that. See, it <laughs> comes out and goes to the other one. And the other one too, if I go F11 over here and go inside, you'll see that Phil actually has plus and Len actually has 20. But when it comes to the one, that has only has the first one when it actually goes in here because len is not provided, 70 will be placed here because the default value for it was 70. Fill is still dot. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? And if I do not provide both of them, obviously both default values are picked up. And therefore, this one is going to be assigned, and this one is going to be 70, 
and therefore I'm going to have that one called. Okay, so these are called default value for arguments. So if the logic of the function you want to overload is identical and you just want to call it differently, then yes, you, ha you can just do it that way. But if it is not that way, if, 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 the, if the, you are writing a bar that is doing something else, whatever, I don't know, that is supposed to do, then uh, obviously you cannot do default values. Default value is only when the number of arguments is different, but logic remains the same. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right. And by the way, you cannot do this. You cannot say, I'm not going to provide the first one, put assignment instead. You can't do that. The syntax should make sense. You cannot have a no argument passed over there. This is very easily explained if, like, if uh, the way functions are called is taught at, in C. You know how the functions are, are you know, what, you know what, what if, how the function call works? Um, uh, function calls work like this. So when you are actually calling it, when you are calling a function like this, in here you are saying bar yada yada yada. Okay, let me split the window in two. <clears throat> this is your function, correct? And these, this is your function call, correct? So the function call is done like this. Look, void character fill equals dash. And uh, I have a question. Can you, can you see this or is it too small? Can, can you see it back there? Is it readable? No? Now it is 80, 80 20. <laughs> can you read that? Okay, so let me go one more. Okay. So when you are calling the function like that, it actually, this is what it means. Uh, integer len is equal to 10. This what the function call is what the function it, this is how the function is called. You know that arguments are actually variables that get created inside the function, right? It's like you created a variable inside the function. The only difference between fill and i in bar is that fill gets initialized at the moment of calling, but i is unis uninitialized. So all arguments of a function, they get initialized by the values that are passed to them. You follow that? That's how all the functions are called. So essentially, fill, when the function is called at line 6, fill will have no value in it other than dash when it gets created. It gets initialized right off bat with dash in it. And at line 7, when bar is called, the old field in the last call is dead, a new field is getting created, and it's getting created with a plus character. And the same thing with the integer length. So a function call is actually creating the variable and initializing it at the same time. Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Pardon me? If we put bar 50, that's, again, back to knowledge of C. That's actually a good question. What happens if I do over here bar 50? Or say bar, no, I'm going to put something that we can actually. So if I say bar 65, what's going to happen? Is that error? What's going to happen? It's going to print 70 A's because 65 is ASCII code of A. And we do not have a character in C language. There is no such thing as character. Character is just a small integer. So I put, I said, so because we cannot memorize the ASCII code, they have the single code for us. <laughs> so when you put single code, it actually extracts the ASCII code and sends it for us. Otherwise, we didn't need it at all. If we had identical memory and we knew exactly what ASCII code of something is, we didn't need characters. You just put integers instead. Right? Are we good? All right. So, 
um, seven yeas. <laughs> so how can I write A's? Seven A's will be printed. So if I run it, that's what happens, right? Are we good? All right, so let's save this. Now, <clears throat> now that we've talked, so um, in here I'm going to call it, so, uh, and let me fix, fix this one. So this one is overloaded, and it's A overloaded, A overloaded bar. Okay, and and I'm gonna save this PRG as uh, B bar main. Okay, so that's bar main and that's B. So we're gonna do that. Now I'm gonna come back. So this is how I do it. So when you look at the repository, the file name changes, and you're gonna have all the things that I have written before, so you can follow that. So, next one. Again, I'm opening bar.cpp. PRG.cpp, that's what I want. Okay. My name is Fardad. Call me Freddy. Is, it, is that okay if you call me Freddy instead of Fardad? Are we okay with that? If we do something like that, did I just create a new teacher? I have the same person, we just call him Freddy, right? We okay with that? Okay, we call that an alias, correct? We can do the same thing in C language, in C++ language. In C++ language, you can create an alias for an already existing variable. I cannot have an alias for, I cannot say, call, I can't even mention how is it possible. I cannot have an alias without an already existing name. Right? Alias means you need to have a name. Now I give it a new name, right? Please don't call me Freddy. Okay? It was just an example. All right? So, <clears throat> so in here, if I have integer A, let's set 10 over here. Now I can say integer reference, let's say R, and I cannot just do it like that because it's going to say reference for what? Alias for what? You have to say this R is a new name for something. So in ha it, I have to say over here A. And now I have only one integer, not two. That ampersand, and remember, you're in my class. You're not allowed to ever say asterisk ever in your life. OK? Asterisk, if it comes after a type, it's a pointer. You say integer pointer. If asterisk comes before a pointer, it's target of P, not asterisk P. And if asterisk comes between two integers, it's L multiplied by B, not A asterisk B. We don't have such a thing called asterisk. It's either a pointer, target of, or, or multiplication. And the same thing for ampersand. For ampersand, if it comes after type, it's reference. If it comes between two variables, it's bitwise and, OP345. It's bitwise and, we don't know what is that. Okay, and if it comes before a, uh, before a pointer, it's address of, not ampersand A. It's address of A. Okay, never mention ampersand A. You mention ampersand, you learn ampersand. When you say address of, you learn address of. Okay, name things as they mean to kind of engrave it in your brain what they are. So, this is integer reference A is equal to R. So, if I actually go over here, see out R, What's going to get printed over here will be 10. There is no question about that because they are the same. Let me just bring it over here and put this one over here. Okay? And, okay. and if I change the R over here to 20 now and print A, what's going to get printed at line 10? 20. So there's no question about that. We know that for a fact. There's no problem with that. Are we okay with this? This generates an amazing side effect. So we understand what references are. 
creating a new name for an already existing thing. Are we okay with that? Good. Now, <clears throat> so in here now I'm going to say cref.cpp so we know it's reference, okay? Now my question is, if I have over here set integer r and in here I say r is set to 30 and in here I say set a and in here I'm gonna say c out a what is the output of this program at line 11 10 of course, I, I, I didn't put it on purpose. Why? Because as I mentioned two seconds ago, a function call is initialization of that argument at the moment of calling, right? So when the function is called, when this set is called, it essentially says set integer r a, which means r is a new integer that has the value of a in it. It has nothing to do with a. We set it to 30 and it dies. Who cares? Right? But as soon as I put this little beautiful ampersand here and make that integer an integer reference, this is what happens. R becomes a reference that is a new name for A. Why buy pointers? Right? So instead of passing an address of something to be able to change it in a function, you simply bring it and set it a new name. And now if I run this, you'll see that that little schmiggly dinghy over there for me is actually, is actually, let me run it one more time because it's justification. There we go. That's 30. Are we good with this? So we can actually do stuff like this. We can. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to correct this. That was a bad name. Set to 30. Let's put proper names. To 30. Okay? Now I can actually do something like this. I can say, for example, void. <clears throat> I can create Boolean read integer reference value. Bool is a new type in C++. They got tired of people complaining, oh, I don't understand what zero means. Zero and then nothing but zero is, they say, okay, the heck with it. We create a Boolean, now go play with, but I don't know. So, so Boolean is essentially an integer that can only be zero or one, false or true. And now we actually have a constant called false with lowercase. You write false, it means zero. You write true, it means one. Ta -da! It means if you have a Boolean, you put 55 in it, it becomes one. Okay, Booleans can only accept values zero or one. So, so this read of mine is supposed to read an integer from entry and tell me if it failed or not. C out is a console output. It prints, it's an object on which when you insert a, in which when you insert a value it displays on a screen because of console output we have the exact same thing its sister called c in which you can extract values from it so when you extract value from c in when you extract value from c in what happens c in gets it from keyboard and gives it to you so now what i can do over here is this i can say c in val Okay? Now, didn't I tell you that this is an object-oriented language? And didn't I tell you the very first important thing about object orientation is encapsulation, which means each object can have functions in it? C in actually has a function in it. That function is called fail, which means if you do some, if you ask for an integer and you put some character thing it can't read, C in fails. 
says, I failed to read it. So you can do something like this. I can write over here something like Boolean result. And I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to say it's true by default. OK? And by the way, there's a new way of initialization in C. It's a universal way of initialization. You can actually do it like this. So anything you want to initialize, put curly bracket in front of it. That means as equal to something. I'm going to start like, just like that so we get used to it. So that means res is true now. Now in here, I'm going to say if c in dot fail, now res is false. Return res. And c in is a very shy thing. c in is extremely shy. If you do something bad and it doesn't understand what the heck you're talking about, it won't talk to you anymore. It means if you say enter an integer, you enter an integer, and it's not actually an integer, you have another C in, it won't read it anymore. It, if, if it fails, you have to apologize. Say, I'm sorry, I know. I did something wrong. Please forgive me. And OK, so what I can do over here, we can do over here, it says, so instead of just writing a, a read over here, I can say res this, and then I'm going to say C in, apologize. No, if you're not writing apologies, that's really clear. <laughs> it means I'm sorry. OK, seeing clear, it means I know you failed. My sincere apologies. And now you, you've done this. What do you do when something bad is in keyboard? You, what do you do when you go to toilet? Flush. You flush the keyboard, right? We flush the keyboard. OK, there is actually something that flushes. but. <laughs> So C in actually flushes. I can actually tell to C in to flush. I can say C in, ignore, say, 100,000 characters, and stop at new line. Done. What does it do? So first, you ask for, say, 20. Somebody, instead of putting 20, puts T-W-N-T-Y. C in can't understand it. Fails, correct? So it tells you, I failed. First, you say, I'm sorry. Now you have to get rid of that 20, right? So you say, keep ignoring 100,000 characters or backslash and whichever comes first. Of course, no idiot is going to put 100,000 things in the keyboard, right? Therefore, it's going to keep ignoring all the characters and throw it in garbage until it hits backslash n. Backslash n is code of what? Enter. So it cleans it up. So now I have a function that can read. So now in here I can say what? Uh, uh, integer age. Oh, by the way, in, in C++, you can create variables anywhere you want. It doesn't have to be at the beginning of the block. In C, it has to be at the beginning of the block. You open the curly bracket, you put it over there. Any open bracket would do. But in C++, you can put it anywhere. But don't, please. OK? Don't be sloppy. OK? I know we can do it. It's not like, it's like, like your mom says, yeah, you're allowed to drop everything anywhere. You don't. Put, be organized. OK? So we're going to put it over here. So int, int age. Now in here, I'm going to say, if read age. So now I can actually check to see if it actually reads the age properly or not. So if read is successful, OK? Otherwise, I'm going to say, I asked C out. I asked for age you gangul. Okay? Or you beep. Okay? So, right? So that's why, and in here I'm going to say, in here I'm going to say something like if age is greater than 18, uh, 18, Ontario, or 19. 19? OK. See? He knows. <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, I'm going to say over here, see, her, see out a beer, please. And in here, I'm going to say, oh, that's end L. Go to new line, end. Come on, you can do it. End L. OK. Otherwise, in here, I'm going to say, see out, get out of here. 
or yeah out of here all right there you go so what happens over here is this so now that read of ours is like a smart little cutesy thingy that does what it's supposed to do so when I run the program we don't need that set thingy we've done it mm. I let it be let it be okay so I'm gonna run the program three years later when it runs I'm gonna bring it over here that one over there huh Windows got it used to be smart not anymore everybody get an apple okay <laughs> okay so now uh, we're gonna we're gonna go over here so age is so a is 10 because it's initialized age age is garbage obvious obviously garbage value in it we'll come over here we see out a that is 30 obviously now f11 I'm gonna go to age therefore val becomes a new name for age and holds the exact same garbage the other one held now result is at this moment true because it's 247 but now it's true because it's one okay so now I'm gonna say C in Val so I extract and by the way <clears throat> do I need to tell to C in that Val is an integer no polymorphism the action is extraction you put a float it knows it's a float you put an integer it knows it's an integer you put a character string it knows it's a character string you don't need to you don't have percent the person bigly dingy thingy you just tell to C in read C in looks at the variable knows what it's supposed to read it's an integer it reads an integer so C in works in here and in here I'm gonna press F10 to go through it so it comes over here I should have printed the message but I didn't but my apologies excuse you more I'll be more for that all right so let's say over here we are asking for the age and in here I'm gonna say I don't know 40 um, or, or what do I do uh, uh, 10 <laughs> okay so I hit enter over here and now it tries to read an integer it can't right so it fails it fails now that it failed I'm gonna say I'm sorry if you didn't do that ignore wouldn't have worked I told you you have to apologize for what you did so for CN to start working again you have to clear it if it fails and then after this failure what do we do we say clear yourself ignore everything up to backslash n return the result that is false now it comes over here and it says I ask you ask for your age but um, so um, in here now he's gonna say Gongul you didn't tell me what <laughs> okay so in here I'm gonna say see out uh, your age please and I do like that now if I run it and um, put uh, proper stuff in there so it's gonna say your age please and read the age and this time I'm gonna say 25 it enter it reads the age because it was a reference so age actually becomes 25 with no ampersand or nothing I don't need that and it runs it and it says a beer please and with that we are done for today any questions these are behaviors it's their behaviors I teach C in gets values <laughs> ignores okay remember that I told you each remember I told you encapsulation each object in C++ that is designed it not only it does many different things like if if you really want to like just to show you the number of things C in can do if I just write over here C in dot these are the thing it can do okay so it can do many things it is designed for that and not only that it can do what its parents did before inheritance and if you want to you can inherit it down to make it for example work with with a file so you read exactly the same way from a file so file is a child of what so C in before we go I have one minute C in is an instance of a class called 
ice stream. Not ice cream, ice, I stream. Stream, like stream, water in it. I stream, input stream. C in is an instance of that object. C out is an instance of O stream, the class O stream. But because, because console is a unique thing, you cannot create an instance of iStream yourself. They did it. Somehow you learn in 3, 4, 5 or something. It later I'll teach you. They cr created it by themselves, a unique one, and they called it CN. So you cannot have another thing because you don't have two keyboards. It's one. Because of that, they created this unique global variable. It's not a variable anymore. It's an object. Unique global object called CN that you can use everywhere, and a unique global object called C out that you can use everywhere to write on a screen and have a beautiful day. Any questions? Yes. No, you cannot put it. You cannot ignore the first parameter. It's impossible. That's again. That's the wrong syntax in C. It won't accept it. I did. I didn't. Uh, I said the mechanism was the uh, in instantiation. When I explain what instantiation is, that's what it was. Because it gets instantiated, you cannot leave it empty. You have to have something going with it. Yes. You tell to see and clear yourself, clear your error, come back to life. Now ignore all the garbage up to backslash it. Yeah. But it's built in in it. You don't need to write a flush. It has it. No, it will stop. Wait for you to enter something to ignore. You told it to ignore. Yes. If you don't, if you don't put it, you just say "see" and ignore. It waits for ignores to come until you hit an enter. That's a good way to pause. So if you want to write a function to pause and say press enter to continue, then you do an ignore. All right. Okay, before Jitesh comes over here and throws me out, let me just quickly close this. Questions outside of the class? Outside of the class, please. Questions outside of the class. Ah, I closed it bad, boy. Questions outside of the class.